turn to, I think it's on page five. Um, I can't read my own notes. Either page four, line eight, or on page, is it there on page four, line eight? No, I'm sorry. Maybe. <coughs> Oh, yes, I got it, Lanny. Okay, good, all right. Uh, it says, and at 527, I got a second call from Control um, stating that Sergeant Carpenter requested gangs and she'd, ca she'd called rope on accident. And I told her just that I would stay in route and disregard on gangs. Okay. Um, after he got that call from dispatch and then told them to cancel the gang call, um, did he make some calls himself to other people on the rope team? Yes. Um, and on page four, um, I think there's a discussion about that. Yes, uh, starting on line 13. Yes, sir. At 531, I contacted Rick Ingram, who was the acting sergeant for the repeat offender project, and notified him of the call out. And I also asked him to respond with me to the address. Okay. And then did he also talk on rope air? And, and first of all, can you tell me what rope air is? Um, so, within the police department, uh, there's numerous different frequencies uh, within our radios. So, the area command is broken up into six area commands, so each area command has its own designated air. Uh, and then when you get into specialized units, uh, each specialized unit will have its own uh, frequency or air, is what we refer it to. Um, gangs will have their own, SWAT will have their own, ROPE will have their own, and so forth. Okay, and so when he's talking about rope air, that is the frequency for the rope group. Correct. All right. So did he talk to some other people um, on rope air about the encounter? And I think that's on page five, line two. Yes, I believe he did. All right. Can you tell me what he told you about that? Uh, shortly after I notified Rick, 729 Jeff McFarland and 754 Scott Weimerskirch came up on rope air. All right, and then did he tell you whether he brought something to, to the encounter other than his taser shotgun? Uh, yes, he brought his um, <laughs> rifle. Um, and I'm sorry if I may. We we're reading a lot from a transcript that I don't know that's actually been admitted. Can we just move its admittance and all? I don't intend to admit it, Judge. I'm using it to refresh his recollection about what Keith Sandy told him. Well, if he, he's, you're using it to have him refresh his recollection, he should not be reading directly. Okay, that. I will just have him take a look at that, then judge to refresh his recollection. But the defense is moving to admit these, is yes. that correct? Yes. Okay. And that is which? 14. Do you um, have any objection? I do, Judge. I think that as to Mr. Sandy, this is hearsay. Um, it is his statement out of court, and we can use it as an admission of a party opponent, but they can't use it because it's hearsay as to them. Mr. Go ahead. Your Honor, um, she's opened the door by having these officers read from this. The rule of completeness would suggest that the, that the transcripts should come in. The rule of completeness doesn't allow hearsay, Your Honor. Mr. Robles, I want to give you an opportunity. Do you have a position as to this? Your Honor, I look at it a little bit differently. The state has called into question the integrity of the Albuquerque Police Department and its investigation. And by doing so, and again, I think that this will come out further in Detective Stone's testimony, that his, the integrity of what he did is being called into question. And as a result, the statements made by Detective Stone are the statements of a party opponent, a case agent in this case, and the rule of completeness then requires uh, Detective Sandy's entire statement to come in for the court to determine whether the questions being asked were thorough and complete to rebut this argument that the, st that the state is making that the integrity of the investigation is, is subject to a question. So that's another position which I think the court should consider in allowing in the entire statement for Detective Sandy. Um, Judge, and, and I, so it's very clear, I am not challenging the integrity of Detective Stone at all. Um, we have have talked about the process that is used. It's a different process that Detective Stone was required to follow that APD uses for investigations into police officer shootings um, that are different from that of civilians. That's what we're calling into, into question, not Detective Stone's integrity at all. Well, what troubles me is we have been going on now where the officer's been reading from the statement. So now if I 
don't allow the statement in, that basically puts the defense to a disadvantage uh, in light of the fact you're saying you're not going to introduce the entire statement. I think we've gone far enough where he's read directly from the statement. I'm going to go ahead and admit uh, that statement into evidence uh, that states 14. All right, Your Honor. Um, okay, where, I forget where we were, Detective Stone. Um, I believe I had just finished reading um, lines two through four about being on rope error. Okay, great. Um, um, about um, K-9 Officer Weimerskirch and Detective Ingram. Uh, yes. Okay, and I just didn't remember you reading it, so maybe the objection overrode that. Okay. Um, oh, and then we were talking about grabbing his, the other, the other uh, weapon that he grabbed, and you said he grabbed, uh, he took to the scene his rifle as well as his taser shotgun? Correct. And does he say that at page six, line two? Yes. All right. Um, and then, uh, does he t did he talk to you about when he arrived at the scene whether what he saw as far as the, how the field officers were arrayed? Uh, yes, he did. Um, and can you turn to page nine, line five, please? Okay. What did he tell you about that? Um, would you like me to continue reading? For sure, me? we can now because it's all into evidence, okay. Detective Stone. Um, and there's one uniformed officer standing right here with a rifle. And he's the only one that I can see with a rifle. These officers here are standing and talking to him. They didn't have guns drawn. He doesn't have the male subject, doesn't have anything in his hands. Since they doesn't have any guns drawn, we decide because of the position, because of the downhill grade, where they're at, it's not safe for them. Okay, and he said, we decide. Is that what he said? Uh, that is what he said. All right. Yes. And at that point, is it your understanding that the field officers were all called, field investigators were all called off and replaced with the tactical team that had come with Detective Sandy? Um, yes, yeah, somewhere around there. Yes. All right. Um, on page 14, lines 10 through, oh, oh hold on a second. At some point before he went up to this scene, did he um, decide to give his taser shotgun to Detective Ingram and, and make a decision about his own role in this encounter? Yes. Uh, can you go to page 10, um, please, and tell me what he's told you about that? I think it's line 8 through 11. Uh, yes. Uh, it says, during this time, Rick Ingram arrives. I asked Rick, because I'm holding on him with my rifle, I asked Rick to take my taser shotgun, to take my shotgun taser or taser shotgun. Okay. Um, and was he aware um, that Mr. Boyd was complaining about how he had been assaulted by uniformed police officers and claiming that they had been the ones to first point their guns at him? Um, I'm sorry, could you ask that again? Sure. Was Mr. Sandy aware, Officer Sandy aware that Mr. Boyd had been complaining about how he had been assaulted himself by the uniformed officers and claiming that they had been the ones to first point their weapons at him. And page 14, lines 10 through 20. Okay, yes. Uh, he begins to rant that he was assaulted by the uniformed officers. He says they pointed his guns, their guns at him, they assaulted him. Weimer Scourge told him, yes, but you had the knives. He said, why don't you put the knives down and come down to us? He refused. He said he has the right to protect himself. Excuse me. And he then refused to put the knives down. Okay. Um, was there a time when the, the team that uh, Detective Sandy had assembled decided to move up to the same position where the field officers had been negotiating? Approximately, yes. Um, page 16, line 9 through 11. Can you read that, please? 9 through 11? Yes, sir. Page 16? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, 
there to read a book or to hang out, and if we would have done the same thing or just some random kid up there, we would treat it the same way. Okay, well, that is not the right place. Let's see, page 16. Can I see that for a second, please? complaining about being able to act in self-defense, that James Boyd was talking also about um, how unf uh, the unfairness of this in some way. And if you can read that part on, line, on page 16. Where, where, where are we? Page 16. And can you tell me where the start of that, that paragraph is? Uh, line one. Um, I think we can start it from... Line six? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, line six begins, he tells us that the officers assaulted with their handguns and what happens if the governor's son was up there underneath that rock, just up there to read a book or to hang out, and if we would have done the same thing or just some random kid up there, would we treat it the same way? Okay. Um, and at some point, he did. Th this group decided to move up to the same, approximately the same point where the field officers had been. Is that correct? correct? Um, and it, it, was there a time that Detective Sandy admitted that they sent away uh, the one officer with a uh, beanbag shotgun? I believe so. To the so. perimeter, line, uh, page 17, line 18 through 20, please. Anthony Settler arrives. He has a beanbag. He stays with us just for a brief period of time and then leaves and goes to the North Containment Team. Okay. Um, and uh, did he also talk about the time when... Um, uh, Mr. Boyd threw a sandwich and a dinner roll at them. Um, I believe so. Page 19, lines 14 through 22. Uh, and he had earlier gone and gotten a sandwich from his tent, and it was at the point he threw the sandwich at us. He also had a dinner roll from, like, Church's Chicken. He threw that at us as well. When he threw the sandwich at us, it kind of landed next to us, and the dog tried to get it. And everything stopped for a minute. And he looked and he said, well, he can have it. I got another one. Just, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were, but go ahead. <laughs> and he got calm there for a minute. OK. Judge, it's 10 o'clock. I just, do you okay. want me to finish finish this up? Well, I, I don't know how much further. I, you... I, I can have maybe five minutes, Judge, and then I'll okay. be done with this part, and, and then we that. can go on to a different thing. That'd okay. be great. OK. Um, did he talk about the plan that they decided uh, to implement on Mr. Boyd? Uh, yes. Okay, and I think it is on page 19, lines 23 through 24. Uh, it was during this time that we began to put a plan in place. Okay, and does he talk about what the plan is? Um, yes. Okay, what is that plan? Um, on page 20. It may be on page 23. Well, before, before we get to the plan, uh, let's talk about um, um, when Mr. Boyd put on his sweatshirt. Um, uh, and I think that's on page 21, and what Mr. Boyd said to them when he was putting on his sweatshirt. Um, line 10, he puts a gray hoodie on his, that says Gap across it. Uh, on line 15, he says, when he puts the hoodie on, he says, if you guys, if any blood gets on this, whether it's my blood or yours, I'm going to be pissed. This was a gift. Once he gets it on, he sticks his hands in the pocket of the hoodie and pulls out a small keychain sized mace. And he says, I got mace too, he says, for the dog. I know dogs don't like that. And so he puts it back into his pocket. Okay. Was there any other can of maize other found other than the one that was empty? Uh, not, not that I've ever seen. Okay. Um, and and can you tell me in general what the plan was that they had come up with? Um, Do you want me to go back to what they talked about? Right. They talked about on page twenty. Right. Line three. We began to put a plan in place, a layered approach, which you used a flashbang taser shotgun and the dog prior to doing initiating our plan we we moved more parallel with him not up to him 
but we moved it up to where we were parallel with him on the mountain right here and this is our and this is our final position okay um, and then did at, at some point when mr. Boyd started to come down um, uh, did they implement this plan that they had come up with? Yes. Um, can you go to page 23, line 113, please? Uh, it reads, because of our plan, the layered plan with the flashbang diversionary device, I had taken it out of my pouch and put it into my belt pouch, which is a larger bag on the side of my vest that would enable me to retrieve it without hanging up on any flaps or snaps. As he bent over, Scourge said, Weimer Scourge said, bang him now. I took the bang out, put it in my right hand, and I moved over and I concealed my movement and my actions behind Weimer Scourge so he couldn't see it. The male was bent over, he picked up the backpack, picked up the cup, picked up the blue bag, and as he stood up, I threw the flashbang. It landed directly in front of him and then bounced to his right side in a small crevice of rocks and it deployed from there. Okay, and then after the flashbang de deployed, did they deploy the taser? And I think that's on page 24. Yes. And then did they also deploy the dog as well? Yes. Um, and after they did those things, they began moving towards him, isn't that correct? Correct. And is that on page 25? Yes. Uh, and they began moving towards him before the dog um, turned around and came back, didn't they? Sustained. Are you aware, Detective, that they moved, that, that Officer Sandy said they moved towards them before the dog returned? Yes. Okay. Um, what, I'd like you to talk, uh, to, to read what, how Detective Sandy described um, Mr. Boyd pulling the knives and the posture that he held them in, and that's on line, page 25, lines 22 to 23. He pulled, he pulled the male, the knives out in both hands, held them at chest level, and took a defensive posture. And those are his words, defensive posture? Yes. Um, and, and nowhere in the statement, anywhere does he ever call it an offensive posture, does he? Um, I don't, I don't recall. I'd have to read the whole thing to make sure. Okay. And then on page 26, lines 5 to 7, he talks about his decision to shoot. Does he not? Yes. I, I'm sorry. Page, lines 5 to 7. Can you read that, please? I came up. I had, I made this decision that because of the proximity and the knives that I was going to engage him with my rifle. <laughs> um, and then he talks about what he saw before he pulled the fir first bullet. Um, and can you go to page 26, lines 11 through 20? Yes. <clears throat> read that. It reads, I come up, I held center mass, and I went to press my first round. As I did, I observed the male through my scope turn from squared off to me. He began to turn towards the left. And uh, as I was processing it in my mind, I could see him as now changing his position and attempting to flank us to get around from where he was standing to a different position where the dog was in between him and us. As he began to turn, I fired my first round and I fired a second. And the male was still standing in my, I could still see him in my scope still standing. I fired a third round and when I fired the third round, I observed the male fall forward onto his stomach. Okay. Thank you, Detective Stone. That's all I have, Judge, of this particular part of the examination. All right, let's go ahead and take about a 15-minute recess, ladies and gentlemen. We'll reconvene around 10.15.